Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> a couple of people just coming in with their coffees. Oh, yes. Simon. Simon's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to be the mantra for the afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, welcome to uh, this uh, meeting of the board of the ICS. For those of you who uh, don't know me, I, I'm Trevor McMillan. I have the, the privilege of being one of the non-execs and the vice chair. I'm standing in today because uh, the chair is torturing himself with a, a holiday overseas. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm filling in this afternoon. So we've got a, a fairly healthy agenda, so we will try and keep a, a reasonable pace, I think, going through uh, the course of the afternoon. Um, to start with, we have a series of apologies. I actually won't go through the full list, but they will all be recorded that, uh, that we've had. Um, and can I then ask for any specific declarations of interest that are relevant to anything specifically on the agenda beyond any normal declarations that you, that you make? No? Okay, that's good. Thank you. We then have the minutes of the meeting of the board from the 25th of January. Uh, so first of all, I won't go through them page by page, but has anyone got any comments on the accuracy of those? No, not seen, so we will sign those off as a true record. So thank you very much for that. Uh, in terms then of actions and matters arising, um, Simon, I think pretty much everything's on the agenda that so, is there. Uh, I think we'll pick everything up unless there's anything that anybody wants to raise from any of those items. Uh, sorry, yes. yes. List. And obviously it's very good that that's brilliant that this has been produced. I suppose it's about what, what next with that and where's that being monitored and where's it being assessed. I didn't know whether that was going to come up in your report, Simon. Is that <coughs> going to be covered already within that? Uh, <coughs> so, happy to pick that up, uh, Chair, if that's okay. So, yep. I think uh, Gareth's on uh, leave, but he's asked Gloria uh, to pick up that, who's the uh, head of elective recovery. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to ask, so Nick and Gloria can get that so that we can make sure we can share that with GP practices. I think also it needs to be going through to the performance, uh, uh, performance committee uh, on a regular basis, but also we just need to make sure that we're doing the monthly update of, we've got accurate information that then ends up getting shared with general practice as per the action. So commit to do that, Chair. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, Katrina. Yeah. Just to say we couldn't actually hear the question down here now. My colleagues behind me couldn't hear me. Either. Okay, couldn't yeah. Either, so can everybody so. make sure you use the microphones directly if you can? They should be switched on automatically by the... Can you hear us, Katrina? Yeah, I can hear you too. You can. Yeah. So if they enter the microphones, they should be fine. Okay. Do we, do we need to go back? Sorry. Do, <coughs> do you need a quick summary of what the question was? No, no, no. No, no? That's okay. okay, that's fine. Okay, um, next then uh, was questions from a member of the public and we had none submitted by the deadline on Monday, so none to carry through on, on that. Um, and so we move through to uh, the item on uh, the follow-up to the patient's story. And I think Mike, you're gonna take us through, through this. Oh, sorry, Stacey, first, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, if I can just give a, a brief introduction, and it is a follow-on from the patient story that we heard around um, how we could coordinate MSK services um, better. But this is slightly more the proposal that's within, within the agenda, and certainly focuses on a few key areas, or hopes to address a few key areas. One of them, um, some of the GERF recommendations and principles, uh, which is within, within the pack, 
aligning it with the ICS strategic intent around a single um, MSK service that also is reducing the unwarranted variation, improving access um, and equity of, of, of care. So if I hand over to Mike, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt, but also the SRO for MSK transformation for the ICS. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me along today to update on this, uh, this piece of work. So we've, we've just come to the, the end of the, the, the initial phase of MSK transformation. <coughs> As of the 13th of February, it's pleased to say that we now have a single triage and interface service for our um, MSK services across the whole of Shropshire, Telford and Rekin, and that's beginning to standardise uh, pathways uh, that, that, that patients start upon. That being said, we've achieved, I think, a, a modest amount in quite a long period of time, and we need to think about what, well, what is next, and that's part of what we're coming here today to talk about is where do we take MSK transformation uh, in the future, because we know at this moment in time we have multiple organisations delivering their part of it, and there is some connectivity there, but there's also a lot of sort of individual working, uh, and still a lot of silos that exist across the MSK pathways. Um, we've had the GERFT visit, and the report from that is, is in your pack, um, it highlighted a number of areas that we needed to focus on, and also the organisations have commissioned a uh, a piece of work by an organisation called The Value Circle to again just look at what the opportunity might be and how we can improve our uh, impact going forward as well. So there is huge opportunity around MSK at this moment in time and I would start with the health inequalities that exist and that's what we really need to begin to address through this, through this piece of work. We know that there's significant um, increase in readmissions for, for those people that are from areas of high deprivation as opposed to the more affluent areas. The rates of back pain in our communities are some of the highest in the country. Uh, there's significant under-representation on our waiting list. So think that of the 40% most deprived people in our population, only 20% of our MSK waiting list comes from that 40% uh, of people. So there's clear under-representation at this moment in time. And, and our diabetic amputation rates are, are some of the worst uh, in the region, uh, double that of, uh, of some of our comparative, uh, comparative areas. Um, and we know that we have significant operational challenges as well. We have long-waiting patients uh, across our organisations. We have significant variation in terms of the utilisation of the resources that we have available to us and our length of stay is something that needs uh, focus as well when we compare ourselves <coughs> to national peers and from a financial perspective dependent on the mathematics you want to use there's either a 4.8 or a 15.2 million pound additional spend compared to uh, comparative areas um, on MSK services so there is opportunity both in terms of how we organise ourselves the money we spend and the quality and the of service that we offer to our to our patients. So we need to take this forward and we need to take it forward at pace and that's what we're coming here to talk about today. One of the things that's been highlighted is the absence of a single strategic oversight of our MSK pathways and one of the things that we often consider up at Robert Jones is well where do we sit within the ICS as well and what role can we play and how can we add significant value and this is somewhere where we feel that we can absolutely step into that space with capacity to do so, expertise to do so, uh, and clinical buy-in to, to do so. Um, and so that's where we are looking to effectively, on behalf of the organisations around, around the table, become the strategic lead for MSK services and be responsible for the design of end-to-end -end MSK pathways um, and be responsible for the oversight of their effective delivery. We also want to revise the scope. Uh, of what we're looking at in terms of the MSK transformation group. So yes, continuing the good work in terms of the community focus, but having a greater focus on prevention and population health, uh, and also bringing into the scope orthopaedic surgery uh, in line with the GERST recommendations and these, the work to be done uh, aligned to the HTP uh, plans around orthopaedic trauma uh, and the centralisation of that service. We feel that in this coming year we're going to deliver on our big ticket item financially uh, around MSK services. We're fairly confident in that now that we have the single interface service, but we feel that, again, by working more collaboratively, we can optimise the use of resources, we can implement and share best practice. There might be opportunities around procurement, 
and there's definitely opportunity around reducing unnecessary activity as well, which will further drive for a financial improvement for the system. But at the same time, we are very keen that this cannot destabilise any individual uh, organisation financially. A workforce, we definitely feel there needs to be greater collaboration uh, and alignment of all the teams uh, involved in the delivery of the service. Waiting list management, we'd like to see a single STW waiting list with the application of population health and health inequality focus. The, the analogy I, I give that seems to land quite well with people is I, I draw the comparator between, say, myself and, and, and my younger brother. So if I require a knee operation, well, I'm still earning, I'm still working. He's a bricklayer. If he can't do that, that means he's not, he's not bringing in money, he's not paying his rent, he's not feeding the family. And, and we need to start to bring a more intelligent way of looking at our waiting lists. So we're not simply looking at when were they referred and how ill are they. Yes, they are important criteria, but there's more that we can bring into how we prioritise the waiting list that we have, especially what is the largest waiting list that we have. And we know that MSK conditions have significant impacts on the quality of people's lives and their ability to um, contribute as well economically to, to society. Um, from an engagement perspective, we had a very successful afternoon, I think, with, uh, with, with Meredith and the Equality and Inclusion Committee. Uh, really enjoyed that, that afternoon session. And we have committed to and we have started planning around how we will include people in the planning, development and decision making. And we've started to get roadshows um, booked in, both for clinical staff across um, the patch and, and for our population as well. Digital is going to be critical to this going forward. Um, and so that's um, yeah, we, we will need enablers, um, shared systems, ability to share information as well between organisations. That's going to be critical as an enabler for a single um, service or a single waiting list and a, a collective workforce. Um, and then just on, on the governance uh, around this, the, the proposal is that we effectively scrap what we've got to date. Uh, we reconvene an MSK transformation board that is more representative of the scope and scale of change that we want to make. Um, we feel that that should report into the Integrated Delivery Committee and we've had that conversation there in terms of being able to have access to the variety of enablers that that committee uh, will present to us. Um, and so the, the conclusion at the end of the paper, or just sort of my, my thoughts on this really, is we've got an opportunity to improve the quality, consistency and efficiency of our services around MSK. If we are going to continue to make change at the same pace that we've made it over the last five years or so, I'll be retired before we fully see the scope and the scale of what we can achieve. So we need to expedite that and we need to bring pace into this. And this is where we feel having a single strategic lead for these services would be an important uh, decision that we can make. Um, and then there's a heck of a lot of work over the coming months to turn that into a plan, a financial plan, an operational plan, and make sure that that plan is created um, through engagement with colleagues all around this table uh, and with our population as well. So I'll pause at that, that point and then have to take any questions. Okay. Thanks very much, Mike. Any questions? The bottom, sorry, yeah. Hi, Mike, it's Hi. Tina. Hi. Um, thank you for this, and I welcome this, and I, I think this has been in the ether for far too long, as you say, and we need to move at pace with it. So I would absolutely support this approach. I suppose what I'm looking for is some assurance around community services, mm -hmm. that they will be absolutely integral to that, and they've been part of you know, working this up and the work going forward. In, in regards to the volume of interventions, the greater volume of intervention should be being made within the within the community. Um, and Shopcom are a, a key part at this moment in time of the new MSST service, and that will absolutely be what we want to see. And I think more people being managed with conservative uh, treatment options as opposed to the, the requirement for surgery, that's what we want to drive through all of this. So fundamental to, to what we want to do. And we've already had some conversation about, well, how do we take the expertise of all of the organisations and not be constricted by our own estates. You know, we've had conversations about could we do some minor op procedures down in Bridge North, for instance, and sort of taking services closer to people. But, you know, in terms of core community delivery, it's critical to our MSK pathways. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Linda 
Chief Officer of Health Watch Shropshire, and I just wanted to say I think the, the population of Shropshire, Telford and Reakin would really support the idea of moving at pace. And while both Health Watch have got limited capacity, we are very keen to support the patient and public involvement in this. So please do make sure you reach out to us. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry, okay, that's fine. Sorry. I, I suppose I've got just sort of, I mean, it's really good to hear the, uh, the process being re-energised and restarted. I suppose I've got three queries. I suppose one is why isn't there an agreement on, on the money? Why, is the, you say, why do you say there's a view that we may be four million pounds overspending compared to our um, anticipated spend for our population and other people say 15? And <clears throat> I would have thought, as part of the MSK board, we'd need to come up with a single figure that we think is what that we're aiming for. Um, second one is, just I'd like to understand why it's going to be different. We, you know, we've had numerous MSK transformation boards, and why is this one going to be different? I'm not hearing anything different so far. It all sounds very similar. And I suppose part of that then reflects on this clinical buy-in and the fact of the splitting of the MSK transformation into two different groups. And I, unless I misunderstand it, I wonder whether there's still an issue there that hasn't been resolved that... I think I can see, clearly see why orthopaedic trauma services and acute services are, are different, and the organisation of the on-call and the structure between the, the trusts is different. I would have thought you couldn't really address the ongoing therapy-led and non-surgical management of pathways unless that involved planned orthopaedics, and how you can separate out planned orthopaedics from the development of community non-interventional pathways. And I think, unless I'm misinterpreting what's written down, in fact... What you're saying is board two is about the, the structure within the local health economy of how orthopaedics are provided and the orthopaedic trauma services. But if it's purely about, this sounds to me, and this is probably wrong, and this, but and probably being a little bit sort of just uh, putting something out there, this is still the consultant saying we don't think we're part of that process in the community. We think we're providing a different service and we will deal with the patients once they've got to us but we're not really engaged in the process of how you know, the pathway, how those patients arrive at the hospital. So let me try and just dispel you of that, of that, of that view, of view there, Gillian. So if I start with, with that last point, this is about taking a complete end-to-end -end view. The MSK transformation programme, or certainly what I've inherited and what we've delivered on so far, has not had that focus and that, and that membership. It has very much been around the community interventions, the... the, the, the triage and interface services at Susan Thames as, as well. Um, and whilst in terms of the delivery arms we kind of see that there's a group that focused on those slightly separate elements, there will be an overarching board which I think will be different in terms of its membership that will have that expertise from across the pathways. We also will have a stronger clinical advisory group as well which hasn't existed until I think in the last couple of months, which again that has people from primary care, people from therapy services, people from orthopaedic services, form services. So I think we are starting to have more of a collective view of the entire pathway from our from our clinical teams. And certainly, and, and apologies, I must I, I should have said at the start, Richard Potter, our, our clinical chair from MSK, was really keen to be here today, but unfortunately can't make it. Um, it, it you know, the, the team are brought into we're not, they're not just here to talk about orthopaedics, they're here to talk about MSK services. And likewise, when we talk to the therapy teams as well, they're keen that they can be involved in the surgical, post-surgical pathways as well, as well. So I think it's about trying to create a group of us that have that complete oversight. Um, and I think that kind of goes on to the, the second point that you've made about so, so what does look different. And I do think that what we are proposing does look different. In terms of the spend, I've maybe started to flip on what I was saying. There, there, was a, there was a piece of work done um, a few years ago which called out that the overspend in terms of the additional activity that we undertake uh, probably equates to about £4.8 million. Pounds. That has been the focus, and that's why we focused on the interface services, because in terms of reducing the number of people um, referred on to, to secondary care for surgery. So that's been the focus, and that's the big ticket item that we're working on now. Now, and I, I think it's in uh, the current clinical strategy document as well, the, a new figure that we've seen recently, around £15 million. Pounds. Now, that's looking at the cost of our orthopaedic services that we have and the level of activity that we undertake. 
from 21-22. Part of the job of the MSK Transformation Board is going to be to understand what of that is legitimate opportunity uh, and, and what of that is a result of be it our population variation, be it the fact be it around the clinical outcomes that we have, and what's kind of sort of inherent if you have a specialist orthopedic provider in your in your pack, there are going to be some levels of expenditure which are higher than you know, DGH. Things like consultant costs stand out when you look at the uh, how, how that fifty million pound was derived at as well and the type of activity that, that, that we undertake and people's access locally to those, those more specialist services. Okay, thank you. I think Ian and I think you might have partially answered that question already, but I just want to ask, because we've got a big ticket item of efficiency target of 1.4 million, so I wonder, as part of your planning, uh, have you identified the actual um, efficiencies or inefficiency in the system that we can tackle, say, in your modelling, some kind of a, I don't know, a budget, a number, or anything like that? So, so in terms of the current big ticket item, that, that as I, I say, is focused on the fact that it's our referral rates and there was a comparative between the TEM service um, referral rates versus the suit service re referral rates. And by standardising those, that's how we feel we can deliver the £1.4 million pound this year as part of the overall £4.8 million pound towards um, the, uh, the, the big ticket item. Going forward, this is priority we, you know, it's, in, it's in the first list of priorities that we want to do because we do see that there are opportunities because there is a disparity at this moment in time in terms of the utilisation of theatres across the uh, across the patch. Um, that's one thing. We've had some early conversations with our procurement teams to say, actually, you know, as an organisation, we've made some big savings in terms of standardising our procurement around some very expensive surgical kit that comes in. That opportunity then potentially extends itself over... Shropshire, Telford and Reekin as well. So there, there are multiple opportunities that we feel we need to sit down, quantify, and what we would hope to do is, with, and the, the, the time scale is it, in one of the, the, the appendices, the, the presentation, um, which talks about when we're going to come back with a financial plan, and I think we'll monitor that through the Integrated Delivery Committee, um, but I would have thought in the next, well, in the first quarter of next year we want to come back with a, a costed plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, uh, thanks for mentioning the Equality and Involvement Committee. You, you came along and gave us a very good presentation. Thank you for that. Just wanted to reflect very quickly on, on one of the uh, experiences over the last few years around involvement in patients in the public, and that has been that the approach has, has, has uh, in effect been we've come up, as clever clinicians, have come up with a great idea and we want to tell you about it, you poor patients. Can we try our best to do it the other way around so that the solutions are built on what patients have said rather than the other way around? So I just really wanted to make sure that um, it comes, that the, the way forward comes as a result of, of people's experiences. Uh, an evidence base, if you like. That's point one. Point two is uh, uh, this work has, as Julian said, you know, it's been around for some time and, and we've seen various uh, programs develop and then disappear and develop again. So, uh, without wishing to put you on the spot, is there anything that you would want to see from the ICB to really make sure this one works as well as possible? Uh, so we don't in a year or two think mm, we should have done it in a different way. So, so uh, that, that I'd genuinely like to hear your 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 requests, if you like, your shopping list. And finally, um, if our patient story, our resident story, was presented today, would the experience described be the same? Sorry, one one second. Um, I mean, when we had the meeting a week or so ago, I was absolutely committed and, and remained so in terms of proper inclusion in the planning and the design and um, uh, the, the delivery of these of these services. Um, I think if we look at the health inequalities data, it shows that you know our, our historic ways of designing the service and implementing it probably aren't working. You know, if we look at our amputation rates split by different ethnic category, you know, around diabetes management, there's some there's some issues there and we've got to we've got to learn from that. We talk about the deprivation scores and how they align to um, uh, representation on the waiting list, readmission rates, 
all sorts. Of, you know, there's obviously something we need to do. So, so a simple answer to that one, you know, this is yes, I will, I will commit to that, and I'm committed to coming back to the committee as well on a regular basis yeah. to be held to account um, for that. Um, in terms of the ICB support, I, th I think if I was to to think about my time as the SRO for the MSK Transformation Board. Um, there's, there's two things that, that kind of strike me. One is we've had real inconsistency in leadership through that. I think I'm the sixth SRO in the last two, two and a half years. And so that lack of consistency is also then leading to a programme amnesia as well. But did we agree? Should, did we say we'd do that? I'm not quite sure. Um, and, and so I think having a consistent single lead or lead organisation and hopefully individual lead, I'm not planning on going anywhere, um, will really help um, in terms of the delivery of that over, over a longer period of time. Um, the, the other thing that we've battled against in some way is, is this idea that, you know, perfectionism being the, the, the enemy of a good service and, we, and we've constantly sort of, you know, what I experienced when I first started in these meetings was we were constantly striving for this perfect scenario that just does not exist, the way, uh, and that was sort of delaying us constantly. Well, everything then needs to be sort of back at the back at the mountain. Now we need to go and see what the impact is here, there, or, or wherever. And I think actually, if we acknowledge that we're all professionals with a single aim and clinicians that you know want to keep patients safe, then we can be you know less risk averse uh, through our through our planning as well going forward. Um, and and right now, would I say that the experience of patients is better than when the presentation was put together? I don't think so, uh, because I think this is the bit that we, we need to do. I think we've brought together the interface and triage services. What we haven't brought together yet, but this is the ambition, is the MSK pathway. And I think if we bring together the MSK pathway, then the experience becomes different, because then people are sort of getting consistent <coughs> advice, because there's a consistent view on uh, or a more consistent view on what delivery should look like. Okay. Louise and Claire. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, make sure you've got the microphone there, Louise. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, um, I think there's no doubt we've got incredibly committed teams and everyone is committed to providing the very best service to the community. Mm -hmm. So this is really good progress in terms of the work that we've done. Um, and I'm grateful to, to colleagues for that. So I think the next stage is we clearly need leadership and it's really important then to work through what this means. We've got some further pieces of work underway, haven't we, which um, Mike has um, described. So actually then to think about what does that look like, what, what are the detailed objectives and how can we then bring that to life to see the true benefits, both in terms of health and equalities, which also is related to waiting lists, the clinical outcomes and patient experience for the community. So I think at an appropriate point, it'd be good for us to be able to bring that back um, so that colleagues can see how that's developing. Um, but I, I, I'm supportive of ensuring that we have got leadership to the work stream and that we work together to get the best possible outcome and there is clarity over one service and how that integrates for the benefits of our community, um, whilst ensuring that we deal with all the complexities there, whether it's trauma and other aspects, so that everybody in their organisational roles can deliver the very best care. Thank you. Thank you. Claire. Thank you. Um, and Mike, I'll start with saying I'm fully supportive of the model as you describe it. So um, my, my next comments are intended to be helpful in terms of not setting out with a great ambition and then falling over when we can't deliver it. Um, one of the concerns that I've got at the moment, and it's purely because we're at the start of the process, so it's, it's a request for you to build it in, and, yep. and I think I flagged it at, at the delivery committee. In order to make this successful, and in order to make it work, we've got to have the right resource in the background to drive all the moving parts that will get us to the place that we want to get to, particularly, you know, selfishly for a moment, with my, my finance hat on, but also activity modelling, planning, financial modelling, workforce modelling. We need to get sufficient people with the right skills around this to really drive the agenda forward. I think we've got real opportunity here as well in terms of that new contract <coughs> commissioning model, so I, I really want to do a good job on that because we could use that as a blueprint for future things as well. So um, certainly not anything for us to resolve around this table today, and Mike, I'll, I'll 
I'll try and grab you at some point and we can have a chat about how we start to develop that kind of list of what are we going to need to make this successful because I really want to help get behind it and do that. Absolutely, and, that, and that's much appreciated, thank you, because to deliver the ambition that I want to deliver around M MSK services, I don't have the infrastructure around me in terms of the current transformation board to be able to do that and to do it quickly, so there's definitely going to be a conversation about how do we draw in the expertise from across the, the whole system to be able to, to do this quickly. I had a bit of a wobble on why when you said about having a costed plan in Q1. That may be a stretch, but <laughs> I'd love to talk about it. By the opportunity. <laughs> the opportunity. Didn't say which that, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll more yeah, comfortable. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Harry. Thank you. Uh, I, I just thought it'd be helpful just to put a bit of <coughs> context from Robert Jones on this, and I'm going to have to wear two hats. So, <coughs> this is something that's occupied the mind of the board, Robert Jones, for a year. And obviously, it was a big ticket item. But I think it's important to note that that wasn't the motivation to doing this. We felt that the ambition to do things right for the patient was the motivation. And we spent a lot of time um, at board and in subgroups talking about the opportunity around productivity, capacity, improving outcomes, removing inequalities, <clears throat> improving access and the consequence of that probably is some financial efficiency as well. So this has been occupying the mind of Robert George for a long time, well, for the last year, to get us to a place. But at the heart of it, I was keen, and I know the board were keen, that this had to be a clinical project, not a project in the dark rooms of executives. It had to be clinically led. And what you've got today, I think, and I missed the beginning, so forgive me, is a project that is owned clinically. And that's really important, because that's the only way these projects will work. So I wanted to give this board that assurance. If I just change hat now to chair of the IDC, now obviously I've got a conflict of interest here, which um, you have to accept. And I'm jumping ahead slightly, but it was discussed at the IDC. Um, I wasn't part of the conversation, um, because I couldn't attend, but I would have excluded myself anyway. But the IDC um, resolved to support the proposal to expand the scope of services. So I just thought I'd drop that. I know there's, there's a paper later, but I thought we'd good for the board to be aware of that resolution now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Stacey. Yeah, not to uh, mix in, but I think, because it's interesting, a couple of people have said what's different now, and I think going back to that point around, I still think there's work to do from a clinical engagement, but it's, you know, we are in a different place today to where we were previously. The fact that there are conversations between you know, organisations, etc., around how we can do things differently is a significant change. And I think that's where the confidence comes that now's the time to, to be able to really do something different. Okay. So, yes. Um, I just wanted to ask something really because it's um, been a really interesting conversation. From my independent experience, Richard Fallows has been a consistent and driving force behind this piece of work. And he has also consistently spoken to an involved health watch, so I'd just like to thank Richard for that, because I know that this is something he's really <coughs> passionate about. I'll, I'll pass that on, and, and yes, Richard is, and I want to remain as the, as the clinical lead for MSK transformation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't so normally want to come back, but I think, I think I do need to come back, having been the, involved in the MSK transformation for a long time. I don't think the failures before in the MSK transformation for, were for want of trying and for want of the right the ideas and for want of evidence review. I think the, and it wasn't, the organisations were talking. I think the problem was in acting the changes. And I think, <coughs> unfortunately, I would have to say the £15 million pound figure has been around for, for eight, eight or so years at least, about the figure that we thought Robert Jones were, you know, not Robert Jones, but the MSK system, including rheumatology, so including all the other aspects, overspent compared to our comparable... Uh, peers. So <coughs> Robert Jones didn't recognise that figure. They recognised the figure of uh, you know, 4 million or so, but the 15 million was the figure that we were discussing about five or six years ago in Able to Save. So I think for me the difference has got to be about leadership from the top and about commitment from the boards of all <coughs> organisations and all the seat and having senior clinician buy-in beyond the executive team in all the organisations to achieve those changes. And I think there are nuggets, there are kernels of, of, of growth and of good, you know, Richard said, Richard Fallows is good, he's very proactive, and there are a lot of things that are happening, and it is good, but I think that we need to be careful in saying the reason it didn't happen before was because there wasn't 
good leadership or there wasn't the right information or the wrong, you know, it was, part of it was about getting that final buy-in from all organisations at all levels to actually enact the changes that were, that were planned, really. So I think it's just being mindful of the past. And partly, and that's not just to say, you know, that we've done it before, it's to say that we, we need to remember the past, because the things that we've had enthusiastic leaders for MSK before and plans that have been developed with, with patients and without patients, but it's been actually getting them over the line and actually then saying, well, we've got, how do we commit? And that is about having a strict timeline, sticking to a timeline and actually making decisions at the right time, I think. And, and, and Julian, I'll defer to your sort of system memory. It, it goes longer than mine, uh, 10 or 8 months or so. Um, and, and I think it does feel like we are getting better um, buy-in from, from the clinical team. It certainly feels that way at Robert Jones. I have conversations with some of the team at, at SAP as well, and there's definitely that, that feeling as, as well. Again, TROPCOM, we're, we're having the conversations with the clinical leads there, so it does feel as though there is a commitment. Um, but no, I, I, I take them with it. And, and for me, it, it's about action, because that's what I came into, was something where like, so what are we actually going to do then? Are we going to make a change? Are we going to commit to it and, uh, and, and make that leap? And, and, I think there are there is more buying from clinicians. There are younger clinicians who've not been in for the system for 20, 30 years, and those younger clinicians are still very, very experienced clinicians, but they aren't sort of perhaps bound by some of the historical sort of boundaries that we had. So I think you know, you know the, those people coming through are different. So I think it does feel different, and I think it can be achieved, but we just need to make sure that we do stick at it and drive through yeah. those. Changes. It will be for the benefit of patients and for the benefit of the local health economy. Okay, thank you. Louise. Yeah, I was just going to build a little bit on that. So I think the ambition to um, consider where we go now with the um, work stream and how we extend the transformation work. So we've got ambition around that, we've got a shared view and vision around that. All organisations can contribute is absolutely right. I think building on what Stacey was saying, there's definitely active conversations and those have strengthened, I think, and become yeah. more effective, haven't they? Yeah. The clinical engagement point's really important because, of course, um, our teams are really focused on delivering care and actually we need to try and free them up to ensure that they do engage in this. We get the multidisciplinary um, contribution and also involve the public and community as well in terms of... Um, how things will look and feel for the future and what their experience would be. So I think those next steps are so important, aren't they, in how this work then um, is developed and what the boundaries to that work are and, and what the detail is um, and the principles. Um, but I think having that ambition and agreeing that we want to do more is, is a good thing. Thank you. Can I just add one personal thing to uh, before we close it out? In terms of perhaps more resources might be a daft thing. This is going to be a really, really important model project for the system. So can we make sure that all elements are really well documented? Almost employ a historian as you're going along to, to document it all so that actually, whether it works or not, we have a pretty good idea at the end why it worked or not. Um, because if it does work, then it's going to be really important lessons, I think, for, for everything. So putting resource to that rather than somebody having to wait through minutes of meetings in five years' time, I think would be could be really critical. In, in, indeed, and you know, we, we had a brief conversation earlier, but you know, it might be that you want to look at some kind of academic evaluation of the work that we do. Uh, <coughs> it wasn't a bid for my colleagues, yeah, well, by the way. I stayed away from my university as well, so yeah, how it was. <laughs> Okay, so we're asked to formally uh, approve the, the, the plan um, with RJAH as a strategic lead, and I'm hearing all enthusiastic um, acceptance of that, so we'll take that, I think, as approved. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Right, next item, Chief Exec Report. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so I um, will take the report as uh, read, if that's okay. Uh, the, as ever, there is uh, a business update in terms of uh, the activity that's been going on and then uh, update under a number of different areas uh, of particular interest. Uh, the first part in terms of the business update just sets out the decision uh, and the process we need to go through in terms of 
confirming the financial outturn. Uh, it needs to be demonstrated to the board because the decision was taken outside of the board, uh, but was done through the correct process as set out by NHSE, and that's just uh, detailed uh, here and uh, set out. Uh, in terms of the main headings elsewhere, uh, uh, we still haven't had the publication of uh, the uh, recovery of access in terms of general practice, so we're still waiting for that to be published as we're still waiting for the Hewitt Review uh, to be published, but expecting both of those imminently, but imminently has been for a while uh, so far. Uh, there's an update in terms of the, uh, the special <coughs> educational needs uh, visit uh, in Shropshire. Uh, that was done under the old old framework uh, that, that Tracy and Andy could provide more detail on. And we've just completed, but can't talk about the outcome in terms of uh, the Telford and Rickin uh, assessment that took place under the new assessment framework that completed on Friday of, of last week. So uh, there's been a, an awful lot of learning there. What I would say in both parts, both of our local authorities, actually uh, the the commitment to improving uh, the outcomes for children and young people across both local authorities uh, in terms of how we work and how our partners work has come through really strongly. The partnership bit and the relationship bit has come through really strongly in both uh, and <coughs> equally recognising the areas and knowing where we need to improve and being honest and upfront about that right early on in both local authorities uh, areas has also been really clear. And I think that's landed well with the inspectors because actually what both inspector teams said was actually you know where your issues are, you know what you need to do in terms of improve those, uh, you need to get on and deliver on that improvement journey. Uh, Tracy, you've led in terms of both, but I'm not sure if there's anything you want to update or add to that. Uh, no, I no. think I've, I wasn't involved in the Shropshire oh, send, but in terms of the Telford send, that was a very accurate reflection of the feedback from the inspectors in terms of our self-awareness and ability to learn from where we have areas where we need to improve. Uh, Andy, David, anything? Uh, so there is a separate attachment in the appendices which is the first draft uh, of the joint forward plan. At this point uh, Claire Parker sitting down at the end so I'm just going to ask Claire to introduce this part because uh, we've got a responsibility to publish in March, but we just need to set the context around why this version looks like this and what happens next. Claire. Yes, so it's a, it's a very draft draft of the joint plan. We recognise that um, we've had some action to Thanks as well to local authority colleagues around some of the place based in the the, um, the JSNA data, for example. There's a few caveats with this document. Collating the information and kind of building on the, the work that we did in the development session with the board to try and get the flow right, it won't be right at this point. It's just starting to describe what our ambition is. There's not enough how in this document yet. Um, there's um, a, a degree of information that I took out of previous long-term plans that seemed still relevant, that needs some considerable updating um, and reworking. There are a number of placeholders um, where we're still actively working on those sections. And of course, there's also the engagement, the big health and wellbeing conversation and the engagement with stakeholders um, and we had one on Monday afternoon with the integrated care partnership stakeholder group that was really focusing on how do we do something that's different and how do we build that into our plan because if we carry on doing the same things that we've always done um, we'll get the same things that we've always had um, and it's really about trying to think differently and be solution focused and that was a really really positive event and because all that is very recent, it's not being pulled through into this draft. So this draft for me is the baseline. It's to start the work and the, um, the further engagement on now until we get to the final draft at the end of June. Um, I want those engagement <coughs> themes to be really visible through this plan. Even if we can't deliver them, it needs to be clear why not. Um, I think we need to look at the places and the neighbourhoods uh, particularly um, because those are some of the themes that are coming through um, and then any feedback we'll, we'll log 
and we will consider to go into the plan as we develop it. The work really starts now, <coughs> going forward, I think over the next three months. Um, but I'm very confident that actually we'll have a really good plan um, that our public and we can see where we've contributed to and what our ambition is. It also has to hang together with all the other various strategies. So to me, this is the overarching plan for the integrated strategy that the Integrated Care Partnership Board approved two weeks ago. Thank you, Claire. Uh, uh, so I'll continue, Chair, and then people can come back to any yep, other sections. Uh, talk about the impact of industrial action uh, in terms of that, and important that I recognise and thank uh, provider colleagues and partners across the table. People have absolutely stepped up and worked uh, really hard uh, to minimise the, the impact of that, and that's not been without consequence on individuals uh, and in terms of how that's been provided, I think uh, I think we were all relieved to see a pause in the industrial action uh, for a number of our uh, 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 staff groups, uh, but are genuinely concerned about the upcoming four-day uh, junior doctor industrial action that's due to take place that will start immediately after the Easter Bank holiday weekend. Uh, it would be uh, remiss of me not to flag that as of significant concern. We know urgency and emergency care pressure, uh, systems and our pathways are still under pressure. We've still got uh, 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 real challenges in that area as we head into a four-day bank holiday weekend and then come out of that to a four-day junior doctor strike uh, uh, across all parts of the system. Uh, there is genuine concern in terms of uh, that, that provision. And equally, the first junior doctor strike, a lot of the work was covered with consultant goodwill and, and people doing above and beyond I think there is concern in terms of how long can you continue to expect that to be provided as we go, go through in terms of that. So uh, flagging that in terms of how we've managed previously, but recognising what we've got coming up. Uh, Shrewsbury Health and Wellbeing, at Shrewsbury Health and Wellbeing Hub Development, there's an update in terms of there. Uh, there were some uh, press reports around this at the weekend in terms of uh, the capital uh, resource and the pause in terms of that, uh, that we're still working through with NHSE and national colleagues in terms of what does that mean and what the next steps are uh, in that regard, irrespective of uh, what happens with capital or what happens with the Cavell development, uh, we've got a genuine challenge around uh, the sustainability of general practice uh, and the premises and the space to deliver really strong sustainable general practice across the Shrewsbury patch in this example, but we could roll that out in terms of a number of other areas across our patch. Uh, and if we're to build a sustainable integrated care system that delivers integrated care that meets the needs of the population, you can't do that with strong, without strong and sustainable general practice that underpins it. Uh, and so I irrespective of what happens with the Cavell Centre, that issue doesn't go away in terms of how we build, uh, we build the resilience in, in, that, in, the, in the right way. We've already touched on uh, the waiting times uh, piece, uh, but uh, I also recognise that this was drafted at a point in time, uh, and it's a, almost it's a day-by-day -day principle that uh, Louise, Stacey and colleagues are going through in terms of uh, delivering a March position and delivering an April position. Significant scrutiny in, in our providers uh, in terms of uh, uh, dealing with and responding to the 78-week wait position. Uh, and I'm sure if needed, uh, either Louise or Stacey could provide a, a more detailed update. Uh, update to the board in terms of uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the ICB as a commissioner is doing with MPFT uh, in terms of how do we start to think about the development of uh, uh, commissioning uh, and provision in terms of our mental health services, uh, wider than just mental health services gets into learning disability and autism. So how do we use the flexibility to blur the boundaries between the commission and provider uh, uh, without getting ourselves in the wrong place in terms of conflict of interest but play to each other's strengths to combine resource in a way that really starts to think about how we can do this differently. That will involve both of our local authorities. It, it's a, I think it's an exciting innovative way for us to look at how we develop services and how we work together going forward. So grateful for uh, Neil uh, and MPFT colleagues to be working with us in that space. Summary in terms of the National Staff Survey results and an update on the notification of the running cost uh, allowance uh, that uh, we've been written to in terms of the ICB uh, uh, that sets out what that looks like over the next couple of years and we're working through with the executive team and with staff in terms of, of that. Uh, I think that feels like a natural progression as we start to talk about place-based development, we start to talk about provider collaboration, uh, uh, so the move to being the strategic commissioner uh, uh, and that facilitator and that connector from an ICB perspective 
uh, while supporting place development and supporting provider collaboration, uh, for me that makes perfect sense in terms of how we manage that transition, how we take that uh, forward. Uh, we'll pause there, Chair. Happy to take questions, uh, comments, uh, or uh, further additions to, on any of those bits. Okay. Any questions, Julian? <coughs> Provide a collaborative, which I think is a brilliant initiative. I think that, you know, in terms of the direction of travel, in terms of moving towards collaborative working across the commissioner and provider, I think mental health seems an ideal place to start with. <coughs> there was only two things that I wanted to raise about having read. Well, three things. One is that and it's a minor point, but it's having embedded papers in a PDF. You can't read the uh, embedded document, so it's hard to, some of the detail of the paper's hard to read because you can't access it. But I suppose it's about the in place level involvement and um, patient engagement, really. I notice, I think that the board at outset doesn't have patient engagement in, but it says it will bring it in at an early stage. Whereas I think that really, in the new world, we should be having patients in from the start not sort of bringing them in at a slightly later stage. So that would be, I don't know other people's views on that, Meredith, and uh, probably got a, a definite view on that. And the second one is, it seems a massive opportunity that this is one area where place-based design of care and, you know, and, and looking at the needs at place level is going to come through through mental health provision. And I wonder whether that bit should be strengthened more within this plan, showing a greater involvement or a greater building up from place into that bigger ICS sort of a collaborative Shropshire and Telford and Recon. So those are the, the two points. It's patient involvement and strengthening the place-based you know, element of it. I'm not sure if Neil wants to come in and respond to some of that. Yeah, <clears throat> happy to, thank you. Um, we know where this works. It works because of collaboration, because all key partners are coming together. And I think, Julian, you're absolutely right. We've got to explore that. We've got to get this right from the beginning and not fight rearguard actions. One of the things that I'm particularly proud of, and it's going to happen in the next four weeks, to a board position, we've just appointed a director of lived experience, someone with significant experience of using our services, who will sit at the board, but will also form groups around them so we can get real intelligence coming forward. And I think a great way to do that is through the place that you've described. And I think the only other thing I could add, Trevor, is the board of MPFT is totally committed to this as a direction of travel. And we believe this is the future if we're going to get it right for our service users and patients. Thank you. Yes, um, David and Meredith. Yeah. I think in terms of the GP access, I think my concerns here would be the, the actual expectation when NHSC, the word recovery, it's, 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 um, it's a bit worrying because if we compare the data compared to 2019, we only have increased our pay, uh, appointment capacity by at least 5% across the patch. Um, from the last um, uh, GP report, access report, we know that we have 12% less GPs and 27% less GP partners in the patch. So effectively what we're saying is that we are at risk of making us, our GPs work even harder and a de facto reduction in funding because the new contract, the new GMS contract this year has not factored in any inflationary operational pressure. And secondly, some of these targets may not be actually be achievable, which means that we have a further funding reduction to general practice, which will uh, affect the, um, the, the, the sustainability of general practice locally. So I just want to highlight that uh, about some realism and expectation. Okay. David. Thank you. Uh, mine relates, one of my points relates to Ian's comments. Um, we're delighted that the Immens uh, publication um, is on its way regarding recovering access to primary care. It is a significant priority for our residents in Delft and Reakin, and I assume similar across Shropshire as well. So it is a top priority. But the other uh, element that relates to my comment is the use of pharmacies. So I still think there's far more we can do that will clearly help GP um, pressures that Ian's referring to there. Um, do we maximise the use of and the uh, infrastructure that's available in our communities? I would argue not. And it was a debate and discussion at the Health and Wellbeing Board at Health and Reakin, I think, um, early this week, actually. Um, it's an area I, I think is untapped in certain parts of our communities. I'm not so sure from a structure point of view, but I know it's evident clearly in Telford and Thank you, Chair. Okay. 
Thanks, David. Meredith. Thanks very much. Um, I've been in meetings with Julian for about six years now, and um, it's really nice to hear from him from the other side of the table exactly what I was going to say. So uh, thanks very much, <laughs> Julian, for paying attention. To all those years. Uh, uh, just a couple of things. Um, I was very interested in Neil's comments too about uh, involving people in, in a particular way, uh, and we need kind of breadth and depth and and uh, and. and uh, uh, and, and lots of different mechanisms for involving people. It's not just about finding one vehicle, but uh, being comprehensive. So that's great. Um, around the forward plan, uh, joint forward plan, Simon, um, reading it, it did come across, and, and I'm not going to comment on it because it is draft and it's working and so forth, but there's a real risk that it ends up being a tremendously brilliant uh, document at setting out what loads of people have said and, and we think, yeah, they're probably all the right things. And I would like there to be, or I, I propose that there might be some material in there which says, we have to make really difficult decisions because we haven't got enough money, we haven't got enough staff, we haven't got enough time, uh, but we want to make sure things are as good as they can be, wherever they can be. Therefore, some things have to change for the following reasons, and they are going to be these things so that we know that the next five years are actually going to be framed differently, not just a continuation of struggling to do what we know we can't already do, as Claire has said for us. But that was point one. I'd just be interested in your <coughs> reflections. Two, um, around the Shrewsbury Hub, yeah, uh, uh, so clearly it's up in the air at the, at the moment. One of the problems around it was uh, many people were were anxious that we're going to get something that they didn't necessarily want or, or believe was required. Uh, actually, what a lot of people are going to get if we don't get the hub is something that they definitely don't want, which is a practice uh, having to close down because its premises aren't suitable or, or, or CQC saying, well, I don't think we can uh, sanction this and so forth. So I just wanted to make sure that there was really focused communication going out right now whilst... In, in the absence of clarity, we give absolute clarity. I don't know how you can answer that one, but uh, I think it's very important. Uh, so there's a few points in there, Chair, that I'll pick up. Uh, uh, so uh, GP, let me pick up the GP workload and the access bit and link that to David's point in terms of uh, pharmacy. So I think uh, re recognising the conflict, uh, uh, Ian, in terms of uh, the, the GP bit, but fair, uh, look, I, and you've heard me say this before, but let me reiterate for the purposes of the board, and I've said this at, at to GP colleagues, uh, the important bit for me is how do we get along, how does the ICB, how does the primary care team get alongside general practice so that when the, when whatever the national document lands to say recovery needs to look like this, that we do that jointly in a connected way with general practice, uh, but we also do that from the basis of why are the things that we need to improve because of the, uh, the issues that David and colleagues are highlighting in terms of the residents' uh, uh, views. Uh, if I speak to the MPs and if I look at the letters that come through in terms of letters of complaint, the majority of those link to access. Uh, and so that, that clearly we've not got that right in terms of the resident experience, but that can't just be, uh, we just need general practice to work harder to, to solve that. We've got to work through that. So I think there's a commitment to work alongside Ian at, at general practice from the primary care team's perspective to work through that. I agree entirely, David, about the pharmacy aspect uh, and you're right, uh, Health and Wellbeing Board that I was at last week with uh, 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 Councillor Burford talked about that and, uh, and, and that was flagged again. One of the opportunities we got there, and it, this is later on in the, uh, in the document, the delegation from NHS England back to the ICB of the responsibility for pharmacy, uh, for community pharmacy, for optometry, for dental, for general practice, uh, 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 building on the delegation general practice. Uh, enables us and should be one of the vehicles to get into that space differently than we've done previously. Uh, having been uh, in a PCT several years ago, not in this system, where I was director of primary care and had responsibility for community pharmacy, dental, uh, optometry, it was a complete backward step when I went into a CCG and that was taken away from us and was moved to NHSE. So, so that's coming back, I think, is the right thing that we've got to do We've got to work with colleagues to build up some of the relationships that have been lost since 2012 to get that back into the right place. So, so yes, it's one part of the solution. Uh, it, we need to do the relationship piece and we need to get back into that space of how we operate uh, in there. Uh, in terms of the JFP, I was looking at Claire, I was also looking at Louise, and we were nodding, Meredith, I think. Uh, uh, absolutely. The current draft is too long. 
it's too much of a narrative and we need to get that to be crunchy in terms of saying uh, here's the context for our system that we're operating in, here are the decisions that we're going to have to take with that context, this is what this means in terms of the framing, we've got plenty of plans that tell us what the issues are in this system, uh, we need to get to a plan that says actually MSK is going to look like this, uh, urgent and emergency care is going to look like this, uh, uh, and how uh, mental health, children, young people is going to look like this, and these are the decisions we're going to have to take to work that through. So there is an opportunity here for us to cut through uh, uh, at some of that uh, and get to that point. It isn't in the version that it is now, but we also need to make sure and uh, that we're minded to uh, listen to the engagement process that we're doing and that that feeds into that. The trick will be, how do we blend that together to make it something that's uh, relevant and useful? Uh, and, and then finally, Shrewsbury Hub, clarity when we don't have clarity, uh, absolutely, I'll, uh, I'll pass that to the primary care team and hope that they can sort that. Thank you. Okay, yes. What this means for patients and in terms of improved outcomes, because I thought the mental health bit on page 83 was really strong on that, and if we could weave that all the way through, I think that could be really I think that's strong. a really good point, Tina, in terms of, uh, and, and where it should be starting, actually, is uh, whatever our strategy or plan is, the impact for our residents in terms of a pro an improved experience, improved outcomes, needs to be first and foremost, and then uh, how we structure our services after that needs to be delivered against that, and then lead us into the next part of the agenda uh, with a very neat segue in terms of the health and equalities challenge that we need to address and deal with as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add, it. Uh, for me it's really great to hear that there's an increased focus on public engagement and public involvement in all of the work of the of this system but i just want to point out that despite us being statutory organizations neither health watch have had any funding increase in the last five years and we're not going to have any increase in the next three and that means that you are going to experience a reduction in health watch services unless this system can make some commitment to support us. Because we are actually very good value for money compared to a lot of the other engagement functions across this system. And I just wanted to make that point, that increasingly we do want to do this work, we want to work with you, and we want to support the system. But we all are going to need your support to be able to do that. Thank you. OK. OK, if there's no more comments and we take Simon's report. Thank you very much Simon. And then we move on to health inequalities and Tracy. Thank you. Um, obviously I'll take the paper as read but I will just give a brief introduction um, to set the scene around the paper. So one of our four key objectives as an ICB is to tackle and reduce health inequalities in outcomes and access and experience. And to reflect this, for the first time we saw in the 22-23 operational planning guidance some very specific um, priorities, and they're listed in the paper, five very key priorities um, that supported the reduction of health inequalities. And we also saw within that operational planning process and guidance a commitment towards addressing <coughs> the core 20 plus five. Collectively, as a system, we gave commitment within our operational plan for 22-23 to work to address each of these areas. And as part of that, we developed a high-level implementation plan which looked at the processes that we would follow in order to um, progress our work around health inequalities. The paper that I'm sharing with you today is a reflection of an evaluation of how we actually performed against those processes. And it also provides some reflection on areas that have enabled uh, where work has gone forward and other areas where perhaps we haven't seen the progress that we would have wanted, um, some of the reflections on barriers to that level of progress. So I'm just going to stop there and um, invite questions on the paper. Questions. Can I start with a provocation? Because not knowing any of the history, it looks to me like the dispersed model isn't working very well. 
is that a reasonable comment? Should we be thinking about actually stepping back and doing things a bit differently? So I think that's a really um, interesting observation because obviously we've got a commitment and it's a shared commitment that health inequalities needs to be everyone's business. We can't, we don't want to um, attribute it to just people who have health inequalities in their title. What the paper questions for me and the evaluation questions for me is have we got the architecture, the structure correct that enables us to have it as everyone's business. So it's less that the dispersed approach is right or wrong, it's more about how do we make that work and how do we collectively know that we are progressing in that way. I wouldn't want us to move to a position where the only people with health inequalities in their title address health inequalities. Sure. So where, where at the moment does it all come together in our structure of discussion? So we do have um, some uh, areas come together in different elements across the governance structure. So we have our population health board and we do look to some of the outcomes around health inequalities at that board. And we also have other boards and um, around our planned care and other areas of governance where we have some of that discussion. But that really reflects my um, recommendation too in that I feel we need to have a central place and I think because of the importance and prominence of this agenda item, it should be, we should be hearing about it here at this ICB board. Okay. Any? So I, I guess, uh, I mean, obviously, part of drafting the paper and, uh, well, I can't take credit for drafting the paper, part of sponsoring the paper. Uh, uh, but there's an interesting bit for me, which is, and you look to our providers, because I heard Mike talking about it very much in the MSK bit in terms of actually the health inequalities in that conversation. Uh, but how much, because if this is a key bit for us as a system, uh, I guess how much airtime does it get in boards of, uh, in our providers so that actually we start to then pull that up and through? Because it will be as much about how do we have a structure as much as how does it get dissipated and come through uh, other board structures as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I think perhaps we need to put a bit more focus at place. Um, I think provider level is important, but how we focus in addressing each individual piece of inequalities at place is going to be important. Um, because I think there's a lot of work, not just kind of from a clinical sense, but from a non clinical sense, is equally important, um, which we have seen a lot of the work being done in Telford. So I think we just need to carry on and make sure the focus is there uh, at the place really. Yeah, very good. I have a very strong feeling on this that it needs to be featuring in these in our discussions at a board level. Um, if it doesn't, it will get diluted further and further down, and we'll end up with Tracy's uh, observation that uh, oh, that's some that that's the responsibility of uh, the uh, the head of health inequalities in any particular environment. We very rarely. We really ask probing questions about health inequalities in our discussions here, and I think it would be, uh, bearing in mind its priority and uh, significance uh, for the ICB, uh, I think it, it is entirely appropriate for it to, to feature here with, with our, our leads around our partners um, uh, uh, being accountable at, at the board level. Uh, I think that, that feels completely right to me. If it's not here, then we're automatically saying it's somewhere else less important. That's kind of a that's how it would come across to me. That's just that's just my personal view. Okay, thank you, Andy. I think this um, this paper, its content speaks really to the fundamental capabilities of this system, and it, it speaks to a lot of things that that people have raised already this afternoon. Um, that when I say the capabilities of the system, the potential of the system that I don't think we're realising at the moment. Um, so this is a way in, but a very important way in, to considering what it is that we should be all about as a system. People have mentioned place, people have mentioned using infrastructure uh, more effectively. This really talks to all those elements. If we want to drive um, a healthy population, we need a healthy economy, you want a healthy economy, you need a healthy population, 
we know these things are, are completely interdependent. Um, I, I, and just while I'm on the soapbox for a moment, I think it's just we, we shouldn't be afraid of pushing this. We've got all the pieces of the jigsaw, we just don't seem to pull them together. So in terms of the kind of data that we've got access to, the kind of capability we put our mind to it, to uh, interrogate that data, to understand it, to create <coughs> genuine intelligence from that data. But again, as a system, I think we fail on that. So we, we, we're just not, I guess, putting our resources where they're going to give us greatest impact. Again, as a system, I think we should use all the levers at our disposal in relation to this, which I feel we're not doing at the moment. Um, I think with all due respect to colleagues around the table, the conversation consistently around this table is completely health orientated. I understand that, but if we want to operate like a system, then we've got to behave like a system. And, and that's what I'm talking about, using the levers at our disposal. So as local authorities, as the community and voluntary sector, as the private sector, there's so many other levers we can use to a common focus or common agenda. So I think in the short term, we should do a lot more with what we, we've got. We could use, and I'm aware uh, we've got the uh, politicians in the room as well, um, but I think using scrutiny, health and wellbeing boards much more effectively using our financial position as that crisis driver, nothing wrong with that at the moment, and really bringing all this together to, to address those wider determinants of health. So, sorry if it's a bit of a soapbox and it was just a way into that, but I think we are really, really missing a trick and not operating as a system unless we get our head around this really quickly. Yeah. Julian. Um, I would agree with what Ian and Andy said about it being, well, everything that Andy just said, and about it being place based. But one thing that Simon may not like is the suggestion, and, and yourself and Neil may not like it, but the people who are very good with challenges about health inequalities are the Director of Public Health. And I, I wonder whether they should be you know, invited to the board to be able to contribute, because they will add a different focus that isn't primarily sort of health driven, and, and they are. You know, Liz and Rachel are both constantly challenging us in every meeting around health inequalities, and, and I wonder whether that we could consider that as adding an extra voice. I know we already had like 53 invites already, so I know it's a, a big room that we need, but I wonder whether we could uh, give some thought to that. Okay, yep. Harry. Thanks, Chair. Um, in, in response to the question, is this being discussed at boards? That's probably no, if I'm honest. And given that this is one of the core objectives of the ICB, I kind of feel it should be. So the question is, how do we get that? And to me, this is a great paper, absolutely great, but I kind of, it begs the question, so what? So have we got shared outcomes, which would tackle the point that Andy made about we all need to own this. So if we've got outcomes that were shared, that we could talk about as our boards, then I think we go some way actually delivering this. And to me, that's what's missing, the, the shared outcomes. Okay. Neil. Sorry. Sorry, Neil. Sorry. Thanks, Trevor. I'm sure I'm in a minority of one, but I used to think health inequalities was a dark art, and I'd got no need to understand it. Three years ago, we appointed as an associate medical director a consultant in public health. He has brought in um, several trainees that we have at any one time. They know how to measure. They know how to look at the, the bigger picture that I was ignorant of. And I think it's true to say over the last couple of years, whatever decisions we take and make are through one of the lenses we look at is health inequalities. That would never have happened unless we brought in the skills to our board. Okay, interesting. Okay, so we gone. Just one more comment from you. I think the emphasis on places is, is something of a little bit of urgency because I think we need to spearhead this integration and the only way to do it with multiple providers, the best place to do it, delivering in the community, will be a place. So I think we need to put more focus on that. Okay. <coughs> okay. I think what I'm hearing is very definitely higher profile on the board. I think I've got a bit of concern that we probably wouldn't be able to spend enough time on the board for the board to be the only place where we increase 
that coordination. Um, so Sammy, maybe we can ask you, maybe with the exec team and the other CEOs to discuss where we might bring the conversation together to make sure that the, the board is then fed appropriately and that the right overarching discussions are happening. Yeah, and I think, uh, so, so I agree with that chair, I think Harry's point in terms of then do the, so what are the shared outcomes that enable, would enable a more informed conversation to happen in a, in a wider context linked to uh, what are we making a difference to residents for, so getting that bit right will help that then come up through the system as well and move it from just being, not being a, just an NHS conversation. Yeah. Okay, thank you Tracy for that. Next one, another Tracy. It is, we're all sat together. <laughs> good afternoon. Can you move the microphone around to make sure you... Yes. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon. Um, the paper that's been shared with you as part of the, uh, the agenda pack today um, aims to do a number of things. Um, namely, it reflects on the last 12 months that we've had. Um, it shares the current context in relation to our workforce, which is as a result of a piece of work that's been um, completed across the system um, to, uh, to populate the, the workforce plan as part of the planning round. Um, and then it looks forward into the future um, and talks about work that we've recently completed on our um, five-year people strategy. Um, I'm going to talk about the last 12 months, and then I've got colleagues Stacey and Katrina that are also going to talk to uh, other parts of the paper, if that's okay. Um, so if I think back 12 months ago, where were we um, as a system, so at a system level in relation to people? Um, we hadn't got a chief people officer um, within the structure. Um, we had got somebody in post who was working her notice. Um, we'd got a small team who were um, funded very much on a short-term basis, and that was by Health Education England monies. Um, and we did have a plan. We had a plan of work um, across the system um, that was informed by the national NHS people plan, but was also... Um, had been annotated and made relevant to this system, so it had been ma made relevant to the needs of uh, Shropshire, Telford and Reakin specifically. Um, and then additionally, we had a programme of work that was entitled the Workforce Big Ticket, and that was fundamentally about um, workforce efficiencies and had a savings target of £3 million. So if I reflect on where we are 12 months later, 12 months down the road, um, we are in the position where we have a substantive Chief People Officer position, <coughs> Um, we have a small core team centrally um, who will be recurrently funded from the 1st of April. And within the paper, there are details under the different categories of the plan that we've had this year, of the successes that we've had in year. Those successes have been challenged um, within the 12 months. They've been challenged by, um, I would say, capacity generally. Um, across our system and the demands, the operational demands have influenced significantly on our capacity. Um, but I think quite specifically as well, um, capacity and capability in terms of HR and OD expertise um, in the system. Um, the demands and the challenges on, capaci on capacity has made engagement um, perhaps at a slower pace than we might have envisaged and hoped for. And that has impacted on, on some of our successes in the year. Um, We've also um, learnt a lot in year, um, and that has been demonstrated in more recent conversations about our plan for the five years going forward um, and will influence our practice um, in the coming years. Um, so our lessons learned, for example, are that we want to do, perhaps aim to do less things, but do them in a greater quality or with greater depth. Um, but I'll pause at that point and perhaps hand to Stacey, who's going to talk about um, our plans going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Um, and just to, to pick up on of, of, of what Tracy said, I think if you see through the paper, there's been a wealth of work that's been carried out over the last 12 months. But to really nail down the outcomes and benefits of some of that has been difficult. And I think doing that, that, that reflection. So I think really key as we move forward with the strategy about pinning down what their measurable objectives, what the benefits uh, of some of the actions is, is key and that's that's the work that we're addressing at the moment. Um, I think there's again, um, I sound like I'm going to repeat myself, but it feels over the last few months again a step change. So in putting together um, the draft strategy, um, you know, key decision makers from across you know, the whole of the system, all <coughs> partners represented uh, with our education providers as well, around if we 
you know, with a question really, if we carry on doing what we've always done, is that what we're going to get? So around thinking differently, thinking outside the box. There's been, as well as um, CEO partners, that commitment around some of that at scale, collaboration around mm -hmm. benefits at scale, um, and there's been some funding put in the pot towards, towards that. So again, shows commitment. Um, I won't go through all the priorities. They're listed within, um, within the paper. There's four, the four priorities. Outline sort of year one priorities, which is a, a, a referenced earlier. There's that work now that needs to be done around the, measure, measure, the measurements around that so we can really track the benefits. Is it worth continuing with this piece of work? Is it not delivering what it needs to deli deliver? Do we need to think of something differently? Um, so that's really key, really, at the moment. And also condensing it. And some of it you'll say you'll see in the pack. It's more foundation work, but I think it, it's, I think. it's really important foundation work if we're going to progress forward. Really, need to make sure that that's uh, that's in place. Um, I'd say really three really good events over the last um, couple of months that went to the ICS people committee. So I don't know, Katrina, not to put you on the spot, but anything as well. <coughs> no, I think um, what's been really refreshing uh, has been the level of conceptual support, conceptual input, uh, and a real desire to work as a system to look at our people plans. The, question, the last people committee we had, the question that we were exploring, other than reviewing the plans themselves, was, was around what is absolutely foundational that we must focus on, um, and to really set out the, the, um, the trajectory over the five-year period as to what we are going to do to set up the following year, to prioritise this year and to uh, embed from last year and to make sure that we had a rolling programme with that. Um, and a major challenge to uh, Tracy and the team and all of the provider HR directors and people directors was around, <coughs> are we doing too much? And when we actually look at our people priorities uh, across all of our organisations, I don't think anyone around the table is any different. Uh, we really do have an awful lot of work about uh, really ensuring that we have established um, workforces in each and every one of our organisations that is not overly relying on temporary staff other than for temporary activity. Um, and so we really, you know, there is a big piece that we need to do which will, both, uh, which will have care benefit it will have staffing benefit, staff morale benefit, and fundamentally will also have financial benefit. So I, um, that those will be the conversations that will continue at the People Committee for this year, is about making sure that those are the activities that we're strongly focusing on, whilst also not falling into the trap of, well, this is how the NHS does it, but actually asking, so how do you do it, education sector? How do you do it, council, etc.? To really uh, learn alternative methods. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Any other? Yes. Can I, can I throw a challenge, uh, please? Um, except everything about um, sickness and everything else, in, on page nine it talks about increasing establishment by 400 whole time equivalents. The trend on agency is going up at the moment. If we increase the establishment and we can't recruit, is that going to increase that trend? And if we are increasing the establishment by 400, and I don't know the detail, is that activity baked in to the, from a benefit point of view of those positions? I'm just conscious of the pressure we're under in terms of delivery of our financials. I, I wonder, Chair, if uh, Harry was on the quarterly system review <laughs> 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 Uh, that I was on with Chief Exec uh, colleagues this morning because uh, you could have been with that question, uh, Harry, to be fair. Uh, I think, so look, I'm, I'm going to look to Chief Exec colleagues because that was the exact conversation we got into this morning. Uh, uh, we, uh, we need to right-size the system to the activity that we're doing and we need to do that by looking after our, retaining our staff and recruiting staff that we're able to retain that we can then afford linked to the activity that we're going to perform that meets the needs of the population. Uh, that's a, I recognise that's a very political answer, Harry, uh, yep. in terms of uh, so what have I actually just said, uh, but the challenge there is uh, our workforce needs to be affordable in our system 
to do the work that we need to be yeah. doing that's evidence-based. And I think uh, whether it be Louise, whether it be Stacey, uh, uh, Patricia, uh, uh, you know, that, that whole bit, and David, Andy, those are the, uh, Neil, those are the exact conversations that we are in, both in this planning ground and then taking that forward uh, from there. I'm not sure, Louise, Stacey, Neil, if you want to add to that, but that was the conversation this morning, really, wasn't it? People are nodding, so, uh, yeah. Neil. Okay, yeah, the sorry. Yeah. I can make a start. Um, <laughs> fascinating meeting this morning, but I've had the opportunity to reflect on it, and I thought some of the challenges we were receiving were legitimate. Um, we've got to be very clear, if we're increasing our establishment, what does that mean in terms of our base budgets? Because I think um, the bottom line is we should improve quality, but we've got to be looking beyond quality because we know we're a financially distressed um, health system. So how are we going to play our part in terms of quality and finance? I think that's a major issue. Our productivity seems to be suggesting it's going the other way. So we're employing many more staff, but our productivity is going down. Now that's not going to be tolerated. And one of the things I'd look to Claire on is do we have sufficient, are our plans sufficiently robust that we can put the challenge back into the regional office in terms of if we can increase our workforce, we should see quality go up, but will we actually make the difference financially? And I think that was a real challenge that was being posed to us today, particularly as we're forecasting productivities going down. Mm -hmm. And the legitimate question is why? Thank you. This might be a bit of a bit of a curveball, but in my position as um, Chief Officer of Health Watch, um, I have some really great one-to-ones with the leaders from across health and social care in this system. And what I would really implore is that some w real focused work is done to understand the impact of menopause on the on a huge percentage of this workforce. <coughs> because my concern is that. Menopause happens at a time when people are they're seeing changes in their own family, they're becoming carers for their parents, and they're under a huge amount of pressure at a time when they're developing professionally as well and getting promotion and, and having more responsibility. And I think that there is a huge risk to this system of so many people not being able to manage with that pressure without some additional support. And I, I really do think there is a piece of research to be done about this because I think with the right support and with the right encouragement and motivation to come back into these roles, it would really benefit the retention and recruitment in this system. And I know that there's people in this room who could do that piece of work. We'd be more than happy to help. But I, I do think that it has been in the media for a little while, but it's not something that we should forget because it is having an ongoing impact on the workforce. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Katrina, I think you want to come in. Yeah, I was just going to say that as, a, as someone who's come um, from the private sector, I must admit I do find the reporting of um, establishment, etc., in the NHS quite confusing. Um, in that we really don't, we don't, we really don't appear to be uh, measuring and reporting to budgeted establishments. Um, so I think there is the opportunity, perhaps, to be more transparent. Um, certainly within the People Committee on how we're actually looking at the impact of uh, establishment increases in establishment. Is that impacting on the agency? Is it is bank utilisation impacting on agency? How are we transitioning agency back into establishment again, which I think is a critical thing we need to be looking at as we're maturing as a system. Um, but I, you know, I think there are better ways that we could possibly report our workforce, whilst at the same time maybe having to report regionally using a different method. But it, it, it's in the private sector, it's a lot more transparent what you're allowed to spend on headcount. And when you really go over it, it would be useful. Okay, yeah, Tina. I mean, yeah, I really like to support priorities. And I think less is more with this, isn't it? Yeah. And those priorities for me are at the heart of culture change. And if we look at, I can only speak for Shropcom, but the staff survey results, there's some lessons for us in terms of 
the culture of the organisation, um, which we're currently um, working on a cultural programme. But I wonder, as a system, is culture and values something that we talk enough about? Just a question to leave hanging there, really. But. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Meredith. Yeah, thank you so much. I didn't quite catch uh, some of that, but I just wanted to, it may be building on that, uh, on your comment. Um, it's, uh, we, we want, uh, by the way, Tracy, thank you very, very much indeed for the paper and all the work that you've done. It's really, uh, really impressive to read it all, so, so thanks for that. Um, I wanted just to comment on uh, the, the, the culture. Uh, it's a great place to work. That's, that's what we want to achieve. I've read a report today which is really damning around racial, r uh, rural racism uh, for uh, high levels of staff experience that on a daily basis uh, who work in Shropshire, Telford and Reading. And um, I just wanted to get absolute uh, assurance that um, uh, A, inappropriate behaviour would be tackled and that a, uh, uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion as a kind of a concept is <coughs> proactively promoted and, and, and built into, into our, uh, the, the working life of the people uh, who, who work in our system. And that's right across the board. So, so uh, you know, Tracy's done her bit for us, but I just wanted to make sure um, uh, I could get some uh, assurance this was going to be uh, picked up going forward. Some that will be taken forward but it's also threaded throughout for example in leadership as well as in culture you know it, it will feature um, in a number of places um, Meredith I wanted to hear from someone other than you Trace. I beg your pardon <coughs> someone who is, who is going to be in the system next week <laughs> someone from our leaders uh, so uh, so yes Meredith and uh, so I've also read the rural racism report and was talking about that with <coughs> exec yesterday and that needs to be socialised and talked about uh, or come to the chief exec's meeting as well. Uh, uh, so, so there's a lot there for us to, to pick up. I think, I, I don't think, I've not heard anybody say anything other than uh, a, a, a willingness and a, an ownership of tackling behaviour at source when they see it uh, and that's been a really important principle that I think we've all been working to. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, we can always do more, of course we can, and we should do more, and we need to keep bringing the visibility to it so that we talk about it, because then it becomes more comfortable and easier that we acknowledge that we're going to tackle it and we will deal with it, and we'll keep raising the issue and keep going around that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tracia, can I ask a really silly question? This is an annual report for people, for the, for the whole system, uh, for all, all sectors, am, am I right? The annual report. Yeah. yeah. The annual report is a reference to um, the work that's been done by the system people team, and right. primarily has been funded by Health Education England monies. Right. Because my question is, it seems primary care is, is absent here. Yeah. Uh, and I can see the vacancy rate is zero percent for general for, for primary care, and likewise with turnover and sickness. Mm -hmm. I think we do need to put focus on general practice. Yeah. And primary care, yeah. including optoms and dentistry. Yeah. Because those are you know public are seeing a major issue with dentistry as well. Yeah. So I think that probably needs to... And I think it. that's certainly work in progress. We are working more closely with colleagues that are working in the areas of uh, GP practice and primary care, um, and we are working more closely together to appreciate that position and how we can collaborate to have a greater impact going forward. Yeah, okay. it is. Okay. Sorry, sir. It's only, so, it's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. It's only a, a final point to chair, which is to say, uh, and Barry has already alluded to it, this is uh, Tracy's final uh, meeting uh, with us, so it would be appropriate for them to say uh, uh, thank you uh, and uh, to recognise the support and the difference that Tracy's made uh, while she's been uh, with us. We've tried hard to persuade her to stay, uh, uh, but uh, uh, been unsuccessful in that for a number of reasons, we understand why. Uh, I'm still trying to make it difficult now, Tracy. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, so, so thank you for that. Important. I said that. But equally, I was asked at the board last time for an update in terms of uh, what was happening when Tracy uh, left, uh, and I wasn't in a position to update then. I am in a position to update today, uh, Chair. Uh, in partnership uh, with MPFT and with Neil, uh, we've agreed uh, that Alex Brett, who's currently uh, the Chief People Officer, uh, for uh, so uh, both MPFT and for the Saffson Stoke on Trent system, 
uh, some of the MPFT time that she's got dedicated will be used to support her coming across and working uh, as, our in, uh, as our Chief People Officer leading the team. Uh, we've also then strengthened the support and the deputy structure that sits underneath that so that we've got, so that Alex will plug into that and it's not her sitting on her own thinking, who do I work with? So Sarah is sitting uh, at the back uh, there. But, so we've, we've put additional support in and with uh, the partnership with MPFT and thank you to Neil and his board uh, for enabling this to happen. We've then got Alex Brett who's got significant experience working at system level already and already knows the system uh, 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 because she's working in the system uh, to come across and take up that role. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Raj. Can we all reinforce that? Thanks, Tracy, no. for everything that you've done. Um, and the actual strategy that will come back for formal approval in June, if I'm reading that correctly. Yeah, that yeah. Right? With, the, with the more detailed plan, I think we will. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, we're a little bit behind um, schedule, but I think we all need a five-minute stretch. So we'll, we'll do that, and uh, we'll take a ten-minute stretch, and we'll resume at quarter two. Unfortunately, there isn't coffee, Chair. <laughs> Unfortunately, there isn't coffee. <laughs>
sure if we've quite got everybody back. understand all the issues with the queue. So that's what you need a CEO <laughs> for, is it? <laughs> Okay, let's uh, get a start, and I think we're now moving to the uh, system performance report, and I think Julie's going to take us through that. Yeah. In terms of from the headlines, can't, obviously, can't hear very well at this oh. end. Is that microphone? Am I switched on? Um, what I would say is that obviously I assume the paper's been read. I just wanted to say that I think the, the, the direction on the performance, we've, we've had a difficult year, I think that's an understatement, in terms of our post-COVID recovery. But I do think um, in this month's data, hopefully the board can see that there are signs of improvement. I think there's been significant hard work by all of our providers on our long waits. And from where we were a few months ago, that there's been a tremendous effort on that, and that's going to need to be continued into early next year to get us where we need to be and that and we're under no illusions from our friends at nhs england exactly where we need to land that um, but i think it's you know it's always keen to go on to the next thing and what we're not doing i think we should take time to acknowledge that improvement and that hard work especially in the times of industrial action which has put additional pressure urgent care continues to be a challenge but there are again some signs of underlying improvement there's still significant risk. We cannot take our focus away from flow and discharge and making sure we're getting patients out of hospital to the best place, which is best for patients, but also for our hospital to manage and, and use its resources most effectively. So I think they are the key messages I just wanted to add and happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. I suspect you all discussed this detail in about 20 different fora in, at different times, but uh, any specific questions for today yes Tina it's more a comment really than a question and I should have thought about this because I've seen this report before but there's very little around children's services and, and I know these are the nationally mandated targets and things but I just wondered whether locally it might be useful for us to add to this in terms I'm just thinking of the, the speech and language therapy waiting times that we talked about earlier on and things like that just for our local um, intelligence and monitoring. And Tina, that's definitely in the plan. Um, we're working with the, um, the <coughs> Children and Young People's Partnership Board to develop a Children and Young People's Dashboard. So there's elements of that, particularly in the mental health position. Remember, we are very mindful of things like speech and language mm -hmm. therapy and other children's services that need to be better reflected in this. So once we've done that work on the Children and Young People's Dashboard, then that, you will absolutely see that reflected in this report. Any other comments? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Julie. Take care. If I might, can I oh, just draw out the points from the finance section from the report? Yeah, sorry. Yes, of course. <laughs> Apologies. We can't avoid the numbers. <laughs> um, uh, just very briefly, uh, two, two things to note. First of all, Simon's already mentioned in his opening report um, the uh, enactment of the forecast change protocol. So the numbers that you see in here are those revised figures with a year-to-date position at month 10 of just short of 55 million deficit and a forecast deficit for the year as reported at month 10 of 65.8 million. Um, I didn't intend to, to draw out any further points on that part. The, the drivers continue to be what we've been discussing all year and, and are noted in the appendices. Um, the second point just to note in here, and it's certainly not for... Um, uh, a broad debate, particularly in the meeting, but it's a, a request as part of our annual reporting cycle and our audit requirements. So um, members are asked um, to confirm a number of questions in the paper, which will there, therefore be incorporated into the annual report itself. What we don't want to do is incorporate statements on behalf of the members in the annual report that people haven't had chance to consider uh, and comment on. So they're very broad statements just in relation to um, knowledge of 
risks and issues and uh, contentment that they are reflected accurately in the statements. It's a, a usual thing we do every year in, in terms of our annual reports. So just a request really that um, if anyone has any thoughts, questions, concerns about that, then please come back to either myself or Simon about those. But otherwise we will be incorporating the wording that's uh, in the paper on page 80 um, into the annual report. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again. Julian. So in the appendices, there's a, a paper about, and it, so it does fit into the finance section, I suppose, about the running costs letter from NHS England, and that's not been, as I missed it before, before the interval. I was wondering whether we, we had the opportunity. That was in the chief exec report, Julian. I talked about it. You talked about it, and you think so? I missed that. Yeah. 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 So I was wondering how that would impact on the, you know, the finance in terms of, you know, in terms of. Cause there's a lot of you know, challenges that we need to be bringing into the system because if we look at urgent care obviously the number compared to last year is lower but the performance is is worse isn't it we've got increasing waiting lists and decreased activity in SATH so obviously I'm wondering how we're going to you know and I know there's complex reasons for all those I'm not saying we should explore those now but it, it seems odd that we're being forced to reduce our ICB capacity to to help our providers deal with those challenges across the system. I'm wondering, you know, I don't know whether we can think about how that impacts, really. I mean, I think, uh, so I don't want to, part of the conversation when I did the Chief Exec report for me, there's a few ways that you that we need to go about working through that. Uh, first and foremost is, <coughs> what's the core statutory function of the ICB as an organisation? So what's the absolute, we need to deliver X, Y and Z and that looks like that. Uh, uh, then how do we make sure we've got the right people with the right skills aligned to deliver those statutory function? Uh, but then there's also a strand very much so about uh, uh, how do we want the place development to, uh, to develop and what does that look like in terms of uh, who works there? And then also the provider collaboration piece and that improvement piece. Actually, it might not be that that's a cut in terms of a number of people, uh, but where they work and how they operate and in which space they operate uh, can change, and that can all be part of contributing towards how the running cost reduction gets managed over a period of time. Right, okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, if there's no more comments on that, then thank you. We'll move on. Um, so, the next item is Board Assurance Framework and uh, Simon. Uh, well, it's got my name against it, but I'm going oh, uh, to look across Alison. to Alison if that's okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, so just very briefly, just to introduce the item, um, we obviously as a, as a board um, require a, a, as a core um, a, of its business transactions effective internal control system and a, a, a fundamental part of that is a structured approach to identifying mitigating risk. Um, this is something that is well known in the NHS, it's also well known in local authorities, but I think we deal and, and uh, approach it in a different way. Um, we've been going through a process over the last few months of um, developing a system approach to risk management. And I know some of you attended some workshops that we held in the autumn of last year to um, start those conversations about how we could approach this to help the board and our committee structure focus in on the key risks to the ICS actually achieving its uh, core uh, objectives. Um, so what we're presenting today is the outputs from those workshops and those discussions, which um, some of you have inputted into, and thanks to you for that, for your time. Um, so we're presenting, first of all, a uh, system risk appetite and also a system board assurance framework. And I'm emphasising the word system here because normally these documents are um, constructed around eight specific organisational um, objectives, but clearly we're working in a system space here. So this is about looking at the risks in the system and our appetite for actually uh, holding those risks and managing them. Um, so happy to take any um, uh, specific questions on the content of those two pieces of information which are in the report, but also just to say that the journey on this will continue. We need to develop a, a risk management policy, which we're starting to do now, and to put in place an infrastructure for um, those risks to be captured and mitigated and to be reported on a regular basis here through the board assurance framework, but also through our committees, more importantly, so that we've got visibility and consistency of our approach to risk and how we're managing it. 
um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Any thoughts or questions? Harry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity of talking this morning. I'll just endorse what Alison said that you know I think time has come for a review, having had this in place for whatever many months it's been. Uh, and I think what's really important is because of the complex nature of an ICS and the providers, it's understanding the journey a risk takes so that we can assure ourselves that it's been front of the right forum to give assurance to this board. So I think it's it's a really important piece of work and you know, if you just endorse what Blair and Alison said. Okay. Meredith. <coughs> yeah, um, uh, I know this work's been going on for a while and it, uh, it's growing and growing and, and um, uh, I'm not a risk management specialist but it seems to be getting increasingly uh, precise and, and, and indeed helpful to, to, to me anyway. Uh, but what I wanted to make sure really was that we we use it, it's not an exercise in its own right, I know this is uh, over many years I've seen risk management being being an industry in and of itself, it hasn't actually delivered very much, so I was just uh, interested in Simon, uh, your, your thoughts on this really and, and, and others, um, how are we going to use this in a way that helps us drive our priorities and our, our focus rather than it appearing somewhere near the bottom of every agenda and we have almost run out of time to discuss it. Uh, making it work for us? Uh, so, uh, it's in the middle of the agenda. Uh, at the future meetings, uh, I was thinking. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, one of the things that I was going to so, like Harry's touched on it, Alice has touched on it, in terms of uh, what does a refresh look like uh, at six, seven months in. Uh, the other bit that I've got my hand up for that I was going to come back to and say, if I think about the conversation we had around the health inequalities piece, uh, actually thinking about how the health inequalities bit feeds through into uh, uh, our board assurance framework, I think, is also really important because when I went through, it wasn't, it's not as leading as it as it could be. Uh, I mean, uh, Meredith, the, the, the key for us all is how do we uh, manage the risk in a live way that makes it real, rather than relying on a framework to say, let's talk about the framework. Uh, and I think our, our challenge in whatever forum we're in to say, uh, actually, what's the intent of the meeting that we're in? What's the intent of the decision we're trying to take? And where do we balance our risk in making that decision? So I think it's more about what's the operating model of how we want to work as a system uh, and how does this facilitate that? And I think, uh, as we heard from the MSK piece, actually, we've not got that yet completely right because we're still doing that. How do we transact our business when we're working across multiple partners? So I think we've got to find a way to be able to capture it uh, and learn from it in a way that says it facilitates and supports us working across multiple providers to make mul multiple partners to make decisions in a safe way that doesn't leave anybody exposed. Have I answered your actual question there, though, Meredith, or have I answered a question that I wanted to answer? <laughs> you set out some excellent questions. Say, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure it delivers for us. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So, so for example, in Quality and Performance Committee, our, our risk register is the first item on the agenda, and the things that come on the agenda are the things that are risk uh, are high on our, our register. It's that kind of using it as a as a vehicle yeah. for driving our focused attention. Yeah. Thank you. Mary. Yeah, good Thanks. And this is this is a very important conversation actually because um, certainly those of us that are work, used to working on provider boards, we're very used to a, a more traditional approach to the BAF, which is it informs the working of the board and the board related committees. Whereas the BAF of the system can actually be quite a different beastie. Yes. Now what Meredith's referring to is how I see a BAF and how I would use a bath, but it is not how GGI were telling us we should be using the bath. So I think there is a wider conversation that we need to be having so that we together understand how we use the bath as a system as well as use the bath as a, an ICB board. And um, it is, it's very <coughs> different from provider level. Uh, and different from... Being a pure commissioner, either to be yeah. fair, in terms of that as well. So whichever bit you're sitting in, it feels as though we're trying to find a, a different way of doing that, and and we're bringing. Go on, Alison. Yeah, I, w I would wholeheartedly agree, Katrina. I think we've got to acknowledge that these are small baby steps to a, to a, a, an ultimate goal, and we're not going to get there immediately. And this do this is not the silver bullet. This is just a starter for ten that we've got to get into that conversation and actually feel our way through it. And I think we've got a number of moving parts at the moment. 
this is one tool in the toolbox, yeah. um, going to Mered's point, but I think we need a, a, a review of how our committee structure is working, the level below our committee structure, how we're getting assurance up, how reporting is working, and, and, and actually the visibility of the risks coming through that, and the consistency of how people are treating those risks, what they are accepting as risks, what they're not. We've got such a dispersed model now for delivery and decision making. We've got to kind of step through what that means in terms of how we report risk, how we treat risk, etc. And then ultimately how it informs <coughs> our decision making. Um, so what I would say is that this is just a starter. We've got a joint forward plan that's been developed, which hopefully will provide us with more concrete strategic objectives that we can then review this again look at it from that perspective and then hopefully take it a step forward getting into that more system space rather than the more traditional trust commissioner local authority space that perhaps we're all more comfortable with and, and exploring what that looks like and, and also how does how do i mean as providers uh, other partners we have a requirement to have a bath how do our baths talk to the system how does yeah. the system yeah. bath talk to the providers how yeah. do we how, how do we stop having Chinese or otherwise walls between the different yeah. risk uh, platforms yep. so that we are we really all understand what it is we need to be working on? Yeah, but do that in a way when we're not creating a bureaucracy for the sake of it uh, and going back to the industry part. Yeah, just another 200 people, not a <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Excuse me, because the whole point here is uh, and this is similar in terms of the performance report and others. Uh, if all we do here uh, is collate and then report on what each of our providers are doing, then let's not bother. Nope. Uh, 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 where's the added value? Uh, where do we make the difference? And, and how does that come through? So but what this can't be is, uh, what do all the provider BAFs say? Collate that together. Here's one broad assurance framework that just pulls it together. I know that's not what you're saying, no, no, uh, but uh, but actually we just need to be really mindful of that to make sure that we don't just do a is an aggregate of and let's talk about that because there's no added value in that and nobody wants to be in that space. It's how do we make the difference? I think that's a fair challenge. Easy then, Alice. <laughs> yeah, no problem. What we need now might be different from what we need Absolutely. in two years' time, yes. so it's something we've got to yeah. keep on yeah. reviewing. So, yeah. uh, okay, good. Thank you, Arson. Thank you. Um, next, then, we have the transfer of pod yeah. commissioning. And Tracy. Thank you. So, I'm aware that the board will have received previous papers around the direction of travel for the delegation of the services collectively referred to as pods. And this paper presents to you a collection of appendices which details the governance arrangements and also the final delegation agreement which is before us today um, for agreement and sign-off. And just to note that that delegation agreement will also include general medical services so that we have all four pillars of primary care um, collectively um, delegated to us. I just want to take this um, opportunity to comment on the pharmacy that we was raised um, pre-break. And I don't know if this was shared at the Health and Wellbeing Board, but we do have a community pharmacy lead within the ICB now who we'll be working with to ensure that we're starting to look at some of the schemes that we can be employing across our pharmacies in both Shropshire, Telford and Rekin to look at how we change how people access self-care and make better use of and integrate um, the four pillars of our um, primary care. Okay. So, so, so that's really well summarised for what clearly isn't a light touch approach when you go through all the appendices in mm -hmm. this regard. Yes, Hi, I just wanted to um, let Tracy know that Health Watch England is still using um, dentistry as one of its priorities, particularly the challenges of, of accessing NHS dentistry, and I, I trust that you've seen our report about that from last year. But if we can work with you to sort of gather some patient experience as a sort of a benchmark as this comes into the system, then we, we'd be happy to talk to you about that as things Thank evolve. You. Thank you. Probably worth mentioning that there's a multiple ICB 
approach to this as well, so across the West Midlands. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Working in, in partnership with our ICBs, it felt like there was no sense here trying to do this six times or 11 times across the Midlands. This will be done uh, 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 twice, once on the West and once in the East. Uh, uh, Birmingham Solly Hall will be the host ICB uh, in terms of the staff moving out of NHS England, but then we've got a real clear partnership agreement in terms of how we'll work, uh, and that means we can connect in and link in, uh, but doesn't mean uh, every ICB is trying to form its own structure within that space. Okay, so if everybody's happy, it's obviously not a surprise to us, we've been talking about this for a while, so hopefully everybody's content, uh, so we're asked to approve uh, all of those, and I think we're with the last ICB to do so, aren't we? We are, because of where our board is on. Yes. Sorry, Lynn. Can I just ask a question? Um, because Health Watch Shropshire also provides the independent health complaints advocacy service, normally when a complaint is about these services, we would go to NHS England. So my question is, when will it be publicised to the public that it is coming in to this system so that if there's any complaints, they, want to, they will want to raise it locally rather than go to NHS England? Uh, Alison? Hi Lynn, just to give you an update on the complaints specifically around um, the pharmacy, optometry and dentistry parts of primary care. So currently the plan is that um, the current NHS England team, the complaints team who deal with the complaints for those three um, commissioned services will continue to do that and they will continue to do it going forward. They are um, being re-hosted by the two host ICBs for the two West and East Midlands areas, so the complaints process won't change. Um, I think NHS England currently, though, are evaluating how general inquiries will be um, supported. Um, so from your advocacy perspective, the complaints service won't change, and they're not expecting that the processes themselves will change either. However, we might have some uh, general inquiries coming into ICBs initially, but that's still to be determined, and it's still under discussion. Thank you. So will all the contact details remain the same then? Yes, thank you. they will. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll take that as approved, and we will then move on to the various committee reports and first of all we have quality and performance. That's Meredith. Nothing to draw out in particular today, Trevor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, Any questions? Sorry, Julian. Sorry, I have a question about the contents of the Times I think we've been so far about the high rate of amputation in our system. I think the comments in the minutes and in the report don't sort of <coughs> clearly they don't give the historical background, but they appear to blame primary care for not doing the foot screening in Shropshire. And I think that probably needs a little bit of thought about how it's reflected. Because you know, the history of it is that historically all um, diabetic foot screening in Shropshire was done by the community trust, both low, medium, and high risk. And then because of the requirement to deliver it in line with NICE, which is the right, right way of doing it, the community trusts were unable to deliver low-risk foot screening. So these, initially the CCG and then the ICB were looking to commission a different level, a different type of foot screening. And that's the process being ongoing probably for 18 to 24 months now. Um, but in fact what happened is that it was deemed to be a non-core service for primary care. So there was an offer to put out to primary care in the interim to provide the services last year and some practices chose not to do that and so I think the responsibility for providing that service lies with us at the ICB <clears throat> and I think it is a big issue and it's one I know that's being looked at through the diabetes working group but I think the papers, there was a conflict of interest here, my practice is one of the ten that chose not to do it because we didn't feel we had the capacity, the capability or the funding to be able to provide that service. So. The responsibility, I think, lies with us in the ICB, and I think that needs to be reflected more in the papers rather than it coming out as, as blaming primary care for not providing that service. Yeah, it's a key service that needs to be provided, but I think we need, as an ICB, to have a, an actual, and I don't know what the strategy is, perhaps Simon knows, but uh, this year we've been written to saying there currently is no plan to provide that service in any other way, um, and would primary care consider doing it? Now, we're, you know, that would still mean that at least 10 practices won't do it, which would mean that a big chunk of our population will not have had foot screening for two years. And I was just wondering what the actual commissioning approach was to that. I, mean, 
on that side. Uh, so I, I guess I'm looking and thinking, Julian, where does it say we blame general practice? Um, in, the, in the minutes that are in the board. 380 of the appendices, um, where it's saying that it's not being done in, in primary care. Um, and then also the wording in the actual paper, I think, or oh, it's the implication that it's a primary care issue, where it's saying that you know, there's below average compliance in primary care of the eight care processes, e.g. low risk foot screening, and that's on in the actual summary of the, of the meeting. So I think the, the message coming out is that primary care is not willing to provide it, but in fact the message is that it was decommissioned and has not been re-procured in a way that covers the whole population. I think it's a big issue, and I, I have raised it nationally a year ago, and with I think the national team were giving the assurance that Shropshire were looking at actually provide, finding a way to provide that for the whole population, and that's not been enacted so far. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, rather than us get into the detail uh, here, and uh, I, uh, Nick, Tracy, if we can pick that up in terms of uh, the points, and then Meredith, uh, happy for you to review the minutes uh, for them to what you will have signed off in terms of being fair. I, I guess I, I don't think it's. A blame, Julie. I think it's just I see it as a statement of fact. How, uh, irrespective of that point, actually working through to say what's the plan and what does it look like and what's the solution, I think is the important bit of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think yeah. where ten practices don't provide, that's right. But the thing is, is the, the ICB has not commissioned that service for the population of Shropshire. I think it is a massive issue. You know that we are. We've mentioned repeatedly about the high um, amputation risk and not uh, not having ten percent of practices or ten practices in Shropshire area doing the screening, I think, is a big issue. Yeah. If we can put that up and take that away, Chair, rather than try and do that. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Just to let you know that um, Health Watch Shropshire have agreed to do a piece of work around diabetes to understand people's experiences of services to date um, and the things that, would, that they think would help them going forward, so that will hopefully be helpful. Okay, uh, if there's no more comments on Quality and Performance Committee, Finance Committee, uh, I wasn't going to do anything that spent most of our time leading up to where we've talked about in terms of the performance review. So, Claire, unless there's anything? No, that's to flag, thanks. No, okay, no questions on that. Uh, likewise, nothing specific on the Remuneration Committee. I think, unless anybody wants to pick up on the, the minutes. Um, Strategy Committee, I think Cathy isn't here, I don't know if anybody uh, has got anything. Take all of that as read then. Um, and People Committee, Katriana? I have nothing additional to add over the last conversation with Okay, thank you. Any no more thoughts on that? Um, primary Care Commissioning, the T. Not here, so again, just for noting, unless anybody uh, has any specific comments. Uh, integrated Delivery Committee, Harry, anything to? Um, the recommendations are on page 10 to 11, nothing to add to those recommendations. <coughs> so if we've got no thoughts on those, that's fine, thank you. Yeah, no, those. Chair. Chair, Sorry, just yeah. one quick one, I'm just kind of trying to find a specific point, maybe one second. I think I've just got one question about specifically uh, one, one more. <coughs> it will be about the um, there's a policy being agreed about uh, working with pharmaceutical companies with farmers with the ICB that there is there's got to be a national re there's national rebate but they want to look at the local rebates for um, <coughs> to work at local levels to save some money, but I, I'm just I'm not clear on that and how that because it's going to be a transactional relationship between ICB and Big Pharma. I know there's it says in the report there is there's going to be a scrutiny in place to make sure that we're not uh, promoting specific drugs. But I wonder um, what what exactly is that relationship in, in relation to uh, for the ICB working with Big Pharma. Can we come back to that? Can we get the medicines management to do it? Claire, can you pick that up anyway? Yes, I can. I mean, I can probably answer it from a professional perspective that um, 
the number of rebate schemes that have been going probably over the last 10 or 15 years um, started off in that way and where it became quite um, difficult to kind of separate the two things out from that influence with them um, with the farmer industry so there, there's national guidance and then we've got our own local guidance that goes through the commissioning working group about any additional um, medicines or drugs that go onto the rebate scheme um, and that's approved through the commissioning working group um, it's it, it, it would not be prudent for us as a system to not accept most of those rebate schemes and, and, and pull them back and they are part of the medicines management um, sort of baseline assessment and cost improvement programs so um, we do look at those um, it, it's <coughs> medicines management work it doesn't go specifically through individual practices it's just making sure we capitalise on those rebates. Um, I'm happy to get more information from medicines management if uh, the board needs it. Okay. okay. If there's no more thoughts on that, then we know those. Um, and so we are now at any other business. Anything anybody wishes to raise? Nothing notified in advance, Chair. Nothing, nothing raised in advance. So in that case, we are at the end of part one. Um, we have got a part two for members only. So uh, with thanks for uh, <coughs> attendance and contribution this afternoon, can I thank the, or ask the non-members and the members of the public to leave.